Well, good morning, church. Good, morning. good to be with you and worship with you. Happy Mother's Day to all of our moms here today. Um, hope you enjoy your day. A couple of things to announce to you. First of all, there's prime timers uh, this Tuesday uh, morning. There's a sign-up sheet over on the table. Give Carol an idea of uh, who all will be here. Um, on that uh, particular uh, prime timers, the uh, person who directs the Henry County Transportation Network will be here, explain some things, how that works, and time of Q&A with him. So we encourage you to be a part of that. Um, on Monday evening, our session meets. If there's something uh, of importance that you want to direct towards the session, see one of our elders, and they will represent that. And then Tuesday evening is our final uh, meeting to plan for the fun fests and I would ask that if if you are interested in helping us organize that uh, like overseeing maybe a particular uh, area or whatever uh, directing volunteers if you could be a part of that meeting be very helpful we can get most all of our work done so that things go smoothly next Sunday we'll have our worship service next Sunday and then following that, we'll need to clear out the street where everybody's parked and everything so that we can get our stuff beginning to get it set up. And then our fun fest will uh, launch at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We are hopeful for good weather and hoping that that will um, be a special day for our neighborhood and our community. Anything else that needs to be announced this morning? Yes, Heather. Uh, I'm going to you what Okay, great. And the dates on that is? June 11th through the 15th. June 11th through the 15th, great. All right, let's prepare our hearts to worship this morning. I ask you to just create a bit of space uh, that you might uh, quiet your heart before God. There's a prayer in the bulletin. If you would like to pray that, uh, do what it takes to uh, just make this something uh, special uh, as far as our time of worship today. Amen. Join me in our call to worship. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. We declare your steadfast love
Good morning. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please join me in the invitation taken from Psalm 31. O Lord, I have come to you for protection. Don't let me be disgraced. Save me, for you do what is right. Turn your ear to listen to me. Rescue me quickly. You are my rock and my fortress. For the honor of your name, lead me out of this danger. For I find protection in you alone. I entrust my spirit into your hand. Rescue me, Lord, for you are a faithful God. I will be glad and rejoice in your unfailing love, for you have seen my troubles, and you care about the anguish of my soul, and you have set me in a safe place. I am trusting you, O Lord, saying you are my God. My future is in your hands. Let your favor shine upon your servant. Don't let me be disgraced, O Lord, for I call out to you for help. How great is the goodness you have stored up for those who fear you. You lavish it on those who come to you for protection, blessing them before the watching world. You hide them in the shelter of your presence, safe from those who conspire against you, against them. You shelter them in your presence, far from accusing tongues. Love the Lord, all you godly ones. For the Lord protects those who are loyal to him, but he harshly punishes the arrogant. So be strong and courageous, all you who put your hope in the Lord. The scriptures inform us that our trespasses were nailed to the cross when our Lord was crucified. The full payment of our sin was offered in the death of Jesus. When Jesus was raised from the dead, God gave evidence to all that sin's power over us has been broken and new eternal life has conquered death. Let us confess our sin in light of the cross and resurrection of Jesus, our risen King. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue bring damage to our earth. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and turn them into bonds of oppression. Mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive us, O Lord, for you know us well. You know that we are weak and prone to wander. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Let's now take a moment for... Silent reflection and prayer. Amen. God has raised Jesus from the dead as the first fruits of the kingdom. New life has begun in Christ. New life has been given to us. Forgiveness of sins is certain to all who believe. Rejoice in the assurance of this forgiveness and celebrate the joy of this peace. And now let's share God's abundant life with those around us.
Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for words of scripture that were written long ago. Words that still speak into our lives today. Words that have been inspired, given life, breathed into by the Holy Spirit. Help us this day to have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand those things that you have for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our 
text this morning comes to us from 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to read the verses before the text that we had last week, all right? So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whosoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders re uh, rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Be well, as we, as we work with Peter, there's this resounding theme that keeps coming around. This is, I think, our fourth week in the book of 1 Peter. The text that is supplied to us keeps jumping around to different places. Peter's writing to a group of people who have paid somewhat of a price for their faith. They've been, because of their faith, they've been scattered throughout the regions of, of uh, the Middle East and Asia, and they've been scattered all over. They're aliens and strangers is what he calls them. They're people who might have had some doubts about their importance. People who might have wondered, is God really for us? Because we have this innate sense that if we're somehow connected to God and we're doing the right things in God, life should somehow be good and it should, we should be blessed. I mean, that should be the signs of having a relationship with God. And yet here's this group of people that because they are connected to God, Peter's writing to them, they've been scattered. They've been sent away from their homes. They've had to start life all over again. Some of them have been separated from families or careers. They're aliens. They're strangers in a strange place. Peter writes to affirm to them about God's great mercy. God is a merciful God, he says, and because of that, he's given you a living hope and an inheritance. And he reminds them to be a people, though they are scattered about and they're living all over the place among a lot of strangers, that they are to be reminded of God's holiness and that they are to act like God in that holiness. And that they are established because they've been born again with an incorruptible seed, a seed that it belongs to God. God's DNA is inside of them, and as a result of that, being born again, they are to love one another. Everything about being born again keeps pointing towards this point that he makes today. These wandering pilgrims and aliens, foreigners, Peter wants to say to them, listen, this is so important. Once you were not a people, there was a time when you were not a people, but now you are the people of the living God. What a mag magnificent statement. What an unbelievable thing that Peter is challenging us with. He's writing to this group of people and he says there's been a fundamental change in your status. You were not, but you are now. You were not a people, but now you are the people of God. It is an identity that is formed in belonging to a group. 
I was thinking about this all this week. The power of belonging is a real thing. There's something about being a part of a family that is real. The power of belonging to that family, knowing that the bonds within that family will see us through difficult times. Belonging is important to all of us because we look for other opportunities in life beyond just our families to belong. Some people join fraternity type groups like the Masons or whatever, and all of a sudden you, you kind of begin hanging around and then there comes this point where you cross over and maybe you're given your ring or, or whatever. There's some sort of ceremony and you are welcomed and you belong. Maybe you're, you know, you see the guys because the weather has changed. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this right now. I see all the guys on their motorcycles and some of them have jackets identifying a motorcycle club that they belong to, the cut that they're wearing. They belong to something. There's been something that's happened that they paid a price and now they belong and there's like a code that goes on with that because they're a part of a group. Once they were not, now they are. Maybe if you were to go over to Scotland, you might still see some remnants of different patterns that were being worn in kilts and dresses, different colors, all symbolizing you belong to this clan here. You are a part of this group of people. You belong. One of my favorite movies of all times is Dances with Wolves. And there the character played by Kevin Costner meets a group of Sioux Indians. He's an outsider, he's held in suspicion, but over time he becomes acquainted with the tribe and he begins to hang out with the Indians. Pretty soon he begins to belong to them and there's a scene where the, where the leader of the Sioux tribe, the people says, you know what, you've become a human being. There was a sense in which you were not a human being and now you are a part of us and you are now human. And there was a bond and a connection because of that belonging. The power of belonging is an incredible power. We see it in the Old Testament. The ragtag descendants of Abraham are slaves in the land of Egypt. No identity, they are just simply slaves laboring every day for a nation that possessed them. Thankless task, no importance, they were just existing. And God rescues them from Egypt and brings them out into the wilderness in order to go into the promised land and there he assembles them at the base of Mount Sinai. This ragtag group of former slaves are standing in the presence of Almighty God and there God's voice begins to speak and the covenant in the form of the Ten Commandments is uttered upon the people. And the people hear those words and they say, all that you have commanded we will do. And then as part of the ceremony, the book is opened with the covenant and blood is then sprinkled upon the book of the covenant and upon the people. And they become the covenant people of God. They were once a ragtag group of individuals. Now they become, through the covenant and the vows exchanged and the blood that is sprinkled, a treasured possession of the Most High God. God says to them, you are now my segula, my special treasure, my, my thing that I hold dearest to my heart. A nation of people is born. And through ritual and through practice, they begin to become the people of God. They were not, but now they are. If you follow the book of Exodus through, I find it's one of the most fascinating books I've ever read because, it, because it, it, the, the statement in the beginning is God brings them out in order to bring them into the promised land. And as I read it, like most stories, they always have some sort of resolution at the end of a good story. Perhaps a good story might be told, and at the end of the story, the guy gets the girl. Or maybe at the end of the story, the person who has been wrong, things are made right. Or perhaps at the end of the story, the guy that's been the bad guy and hurt all the people, he's eliminated. 
It's all, you know, and that's the story. That's the power of the story, some sort of redemption. And so when you're reading Exodus, you think, okay, it begins with the people being set free. It's going to end with the people in the promised land, but it doesn't. It ends with the construction of the tabernacle. And on the very last pages of Exodus, as the tabernacle is dedicated to God, the power of God comes down and the presence of God comes down and dwells in the tabernacle. This group of people, ragtag individuals who were nobody, now all of a sudden are the covenant people of God and God dwells in their midst in the tabernacle. And the tabernacle takes on such significance in the writing because every time the cloud is over the tabernacle, it is symbolic of God being there. And within that tabernacle is this Ark of the Covenant, the Indiana Jones stuff, the original one. And here's this Ark, and it is there that God is dwelling. And it's inside of this holy place, and it's so holy that common people couldn't go in. And when the cloud would pick up and move, Israel would move. Forever they are known, not as a ragtag group of individuals, but a people who belong to God, and God's presence is in their midst. There's something about the Jewish people and the Jewish heritage that if you're around them or you do any sense of study, they have a sense that they are special, they are unique, they belong to one another, and they belong to God. As we move into the New Testament, the followers of Jesus are a ragtag group of normal people, just like you and me, who have gathered around the words of God. And in a covenantal ceremony in which they're not a part of, but Jesus is, Jesus goes to the cross and he dies as part of the covenantal ceremony. And when he is raised from the dead, the covenant is sealed. And this group of people is not like the group gathered at Sinai participating in it. They see what has happened. Jesus has made this covenant. And now people enter into this covenant through their faith in Jesus. This ragtag group of followers now become the people of God, the church of Jesus. They were not, but they now are the people of the living God. They become the people of God, grafted into the people who went before. And Peter begins reminding them that they are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. Listen, when Jesus was raised from the dead, the covenant that made this possible was sealed and ratified and through faith. Now we don't just get connected to Jesus, we become part of the people. We belong to something. And that something is so important. And just like the book of Exodus, our destiny is not where it's all going to end up, but our destiny is, Peter says, that we have this living stone that was rejected by men, this Jesus, who's become the capstone or the cornerstone. Everything is measured off of Jesus in this temple that is being built. He is what is, everything is measured up against. He is the thing that everything is tied into. And you and me are like living stones being built together to form a temple or a tabernacle, a place for God to reside. The story is the same. People of Israel become the covenant people and build a tabernacle and God comes to inhabit. We are the people who are connected to Jesus, a covenant people, and we as living stones are being built together to form a house wherein God can reside. We are a temple, a dwelling place, a spiritual house for God. We are a building that is not made with human hands. We are a building that is formed around Jesus. Everything is measured by him. That is our purpose. That is our sense of belonging. I often ask myself, why is it that people belong to a church? Why is it that some people feel no need to belong to a church? 
Some of you have had relationships here in this church longer than what I have been alive, I think. Bob has. <laughs> you have a sense of belonging. This is family. This is special. You wouldn't know what to do if you didn't have it. There's a sense in which being here, being together, forms a significant part of who you are. It's always been that way. You don't have to really think about it, just who you are. You can't imagine not being a part of this group of people. In that sense, this is a place, a peculiar place, a specific place, whereby this whole big temple is now located in a community and our lives are connected together. Peter's whole point is that at one point we were nothing and now we belong to something. And then when we belong to it, Peter says it is important to accept the purposes for which it exists. You know, belonging to something is only as good as the substance to which, of the group to which we belong. Everybody here in our world knows today that there are people who belong to groups who are filled with hate. They're initiated into maybe uh, hate, hate groups, maybe initiated into something like an ISIS or a, a neo-Nazi group. They're every bit as much a sense of belonging to that as you and I might have for the church. But the purposes to which the people belong to it has to do with ideals that are evil or they're wicked. Have to do with purposes that tear down, purposes that destroy, purposes that bring heartache. But when we become part of the people of God and we become part of this temple in which God is inhabiting, we become a part of a group of people to whom we have a calling, a purpose. And that purpose is given to us by God himself. I belong, Peter says, to this group so that we together can proclaim the mighty acts of God. He says we're a spiritual priesthood offering up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. Those sacrifices are behaviors and actions and attitudes and spiritual things that we do. Not just in the form of just offering them up to God, but offering them out. As a priesthood, we are a group of people who ministers to God and we minister to others. Peter says, you were not a people, but now you are a people. And if you are that people, you must embrace something. You're a chosen race, not based on skin color or language, but based on a spiritual birthright. You're a royal priesthood, children of the kingdom, serving as mediators. You have inherited privilege because you belong to the king, but you also have a function as a priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're set apart. You live different. You have different purposes. You march to a different drumbeat. And he finally ends it with, you are God's own people. Children of the God of the universe with direct access to the throne. Belonging to God, belonging to the people of God should work some form of transformation into our lives. I want that just to sink in a moment. Why are we here? What is our purpose? We are a place whereby God's presence can be so that God can continue to do what God has always done. We are instruments, not only that are being built together, but are being equipped to serve together to the world around us. Once. You are not a people. Now you are the people of God. You are a holy nation, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, God's very own people. Peter says, aspire to that high calling. Let us pray. 
almighty and loving God, we thank you for the gift of your word. And we pray now for the grace to believe what we have heard and to live in ways that honor you above all. Through Christ our Lord and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you remain standing and join with me in professing our faith in light of the one who was raised from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of Almighty God, let us confess our faith in Jesus Christ. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made one in being with the Father. Through him all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we will receive our weekly offering.
me in our offering prayer. God of wonder, we offer you these humble gifts, signs of your goodness and mercy. Receive them with our gratitude. Use them to further the purpose of your kingdom, both in our community and throughout the world. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll go before God with our prayers, prayers on behalf of our people and our congregation, on behalf of our world. We have a special request this morning that we would remember Chase Harris. Okay, to add to that, there will be a break of silence in our prayer that you can offer up those who you know, who are close to you, uh, that, that might uh, could use some prayer this morning. So let us go before God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come as your people, to be called your people, to be called people of the living God. What an amazing miracle. Help us this morning as we serve as priests to offer prayers on behalf of others. First of all, for our world, we offer our prayers. Those who lead, those who govern, those who guide, those who administer, those who rule as judges, those who make laws, we pray for them. May they all have a sense of the fear of God and may their judgments and rulings and laws all be for the purposes of justice. Those who are wicked and those who have purposes serving themselves rather than others, those who seek to bring harm, we ask that you would bring down. And that Father, you would cause people to rejoice as righteousness is proclaimed. We pray, Father, for our community. We pray for this upcoming fun fest. Pray that there would be lives touched. People would understand the goodness of the living God and the joy that comes from the people of God in offering to others acts of love and charity. We pray for that. We pray, Father, for this church and those who lead and guide it. Pray, Father, that you would grant them wisdom. Help them, Father, as they deal with issues that we all face. Give them the understanding to make a way. Now we pray, Father, for those in our church, those in our families, and those friends among us who we know are struggling. They need our prayers, and so we offer them now before your throne. We especially remember this day, Chase Harris. Father, be with these and with all those that we have placed before your throne. Grant mercy and grace to them. Bring healing into their lives. Touch them with your love. Help them to know how much the living God loves them. Lord, for all of these things we are most grateful. We lift them up before you in the precious name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. May the joy of belonging be yours in your heart. Go in peace, for we are. Amen. Amen.